This morning, I would like to read out of Matthew 14. You can read along with me if you want to listen, that's fine too. I'm going to be starting in verse 22, a story that many of you are probably familiar with. So, verse 22, chapter 14. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. A lot of things about that story strike me. I think if I were to pick one thing that struck me the most about that story is that Jesus, when Peter cried out for help, Jesus could have very rightly so said, no, Peter, this is your fault. You did this to yourself. It was your unbelief that made you sink. He could have very rightly so said that. This book says that he immediately reached out his hand and pulled Peter out of the water. Are you drowning this morning? Do you feel like the storms of life are just too much for you to handle? call on the name of the Lord. Before I pray, I'd like to close with one verse in Romans 10, chapter 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do not fear God's wrath Look at God's love. It's bigger than any ocean, any storm you might be in. It's bigger than any situation in your life. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Pray with me, please. Father, you are so faithful. You are so faithful to save. You are so faithful to love. Father, you are so faithful to be there for us. I thank you for that. Father, if there's anyone this, in this room who has not called on your name, I pray that you give them the courage and the boldness to call on you this morning. Father, be with us. Be with Mark and Ebony as they lead us in worship. Be with Pastor Tom as he delivers the message. And Father, give us the ears to hear you and the eyes to see you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just stand with us this morning, we're going to worship the Lord together this morning.
The sound of heaven touching her spirit break out. Break all walls down. Spirit break out. Heaven come down. Heaven come down. Spirit break out. Spirit break out. Break all walls down. Break all walls down. Spirit break out. Spirit break out, heaven come down, King Jesus, you're the name we're lifting high, your glory, shaking up the earth and sky, revival, we want to see your kingdom here. We want to see your kingdom here, King Jesus. You're the name we're lifting high, your glory. Shaking up the earth and sky, revival. We want to see your kingdom here. We want to see your kingdom here. of tradition break our walls down our walls of religion spirit break out you're welcome in this place holy spirit heaven come down oh i want to see you move lord spirit break out break out among your people god break our walls down Oh, you're faithful, spirit break out, heaven come down, oh, spirit break out, spirit break out, oh, we love your presence, God, break our walls down, oh, come and be with your people, spirit break out. Heaven come down, heaven come down, oh, King Jesus, King, King Jesus, you're the name we're lifting high, your glory, shaking up the earth and sky, revival, we want to see your kingdom here, we want to see Your glory, shaking up the earth and sky, revival, we want to see your kingdom here, we want to see your kingdom here, oh spirit break out, break out all over this room, Holy Spirit, break all walls down, oh how we need your presence God. Spirit, break out. We invite you in this morning, Lord. Heaven, come down. Oh, Spirit, break out. Spirit, break out. Oh, how we need you, Lord. Break our walls down. Spirit, break out. Oh, we love your presence, God. Heaven come down, Spirit break out, break
Make our walls down. Holy Spirit, Spirit, break out. You're the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of Jesus. Heaven, come down. Oh, one more time, Spirit, break out. Spirit, break out. We're asking you to break our walls down. Break our walls down of repetition and religion, God. Spirit, break out oh, how we need your presence, Lord. Heaven, come down. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you give us this access to your heart, God. Thank you, Lord. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Thank you, Lord, that even by faith we know you're here. Thank you for your presence, God. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Getting powered up. <laughs> good to you this week? Has he been faithful? Even if you haven't received him as faithful this week, he's been faithful. But you justify me, forgiven me of my sin, and now you call me justified. You call this wretch justified. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you've been so faithful through all these years, even when I was running from you, God. Does anyone feel that in the spirit this morning? Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Let's give them a thank you. Thank you, Lord. You poured out your grace on me so thick, God. Oh, your blood, it covers all my iniquities. And there's so many. Thank you, Lord. It's all because you died and you rose again. You gave it all. Help me give it all for you. Oh, Father, Father of kindness, you have our grace you brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace oh giver of mercy you're my help in time of need lord i i can't help but sing Promises and all your promises are yes and amen. And he means all his promises. All your promises are yes and amen. Oh sometimes you just give him an oh. Just give him your worship, your thankfulness. You can even raise your hands. We raise our hands and surrender. He's giving him place and permission to do whatever he wants to do. Beautiful Savior. A beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me, pulled me from the ashes. You have broken every curse. Oh, blessed Redeemer. 
Spirit, I feel your presence now. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises, all your promises are yes and amen. All your promises, God, all your promises are yes and amen. And all your promises, all your promises are yes and amen. And I will rest. In your promises, my confidence doesn't come from me. Oh, it's your faithfulness, and I will rest. I will rest in your promises. My confidence, my confidence is your faithfulness. Oh, I will rest. I will rest in your promises. You're a man of your word, God, is your faithfulness, and I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Faithful, faithful, you are faithful. And amen. All your promises, all your promises are yes and amen. All your promises, all your promises are yes and amen. says in second peter that um, god is not slack concerning his promises and some count slackness meaning that um, to the lord a day down uh, a thousand years and no a day in heaven is a, a thousand years on earth and we forget that and think it needs to be done right now i want my promises right now god but it's on his time and not my time he will fulfill it to you, his promises. Faithful, faithful, you are. Faithful, faithful, forever you will be. Faithful. promises all your promises are yes and amen all your promises all your promises are yes and amen all your promises all your promises the yes and amen all your promises all your promises are yes and amen thank you lord <laughs> Thank you, God. Your promises are yes and amen. Not maybe, not no, but yes and amen. Thank you, God. You've been so faithful. I see the theme of today. <laughs> Faithfulness.
Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness. I could not love thee. So blind and unfeeling, covenant promises fell not to me. Then without warning, desire or deserving, I found my treasure, my pleasure in thee. Oh, great, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I have no merit. I have no merit to woo or delight thee. I have no wisdom or powers to employ yet in thy mercy how pleasing thou findst me this is thy pleasure that thou art my joy oh grace and great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. every season oh a pardon for sin and the peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Oh, great, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Oh, great, great is thy 
thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, oh, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great are you, Lord. Lord, we are mindful of your faithfulness this day. We are mindful of your faithfulness to your promises. You, you're faithful to your promise to rise from the dead. You're faithful to your promise to forgive us of sin. You're faithful to your promise to walk with us through all the, the good days, the bad days, the tough days of life. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We've got nothing in return. Lord, we've got nothing. Your mercy is new every morning. We call upon you afresh this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, our hearts wander. Where, where would I be without the faithfulness of my God? Lord, that's not a pretty picture. So Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness today. Thank you for your faithfulness to each one. Thank you that you are faithful to hold out your grace, your mercy to everyone in this room today. Lord, may we be wise enough to lay hold of it. May we be wise enough to grab hold of what you offer this day. Lord, you are faithful. We love you for it. We thank you for it. It's all in Jesus' name that we do it all in, in that mighty name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated if you would. Thank you, Mark and Ebony, for leading us in worship this morning. Thank you, Lord. And good morning, good morning. Thank you for taking time out of your busy weekend to join us for worship this morning downstairs. Speaking of faithfulness and hard work, uh, we want to recognize the accomplishments of Jossam Alton Bailey. Brother, would you come on down here? He has... You did it. We've been praying together for this thing for a while. And Jossum has graduated from high school. And I know most of you figured he was 25 and off doing his thing. Uh, we have, well, we drug him to, to our outreach to Mardi Gras one year, and then he came willingly the second year, and, and um, uh, Jossum has proven to be uh, not just a member of this congregation, but a, a brother in the Lord, um, and I'm so proud of you. I am so proud of you, my man. He's going to be going to Manhattan Christian College and pursuing what... <laughs> a lot of clapping going on. And just to see what God has in store. He's got ministry on his heart. He's, got, he's gotten a taste, and he has got ministry on his heart. He just wants to take that next step and see what God has in store for him. So would you, would you, Legacy Church, would you commit to praying for this young man in days to come and that God would direct his steps, use him in the ways that uh, God just shown him some things in his heart about serving his world for Jesus' sake. Amen. Would you join me in praying for Jocelyn? Father, thank you. Thank you for the blessing of children. What a blessing for Ollie and Tracy today. What a blessing for Manhattan Christian College to accept this young man. And Father, uh, thank you for all that you've poured into Jossum in these last few years. Thank you for the way you've stirred his heart. As I've watched, I, Lord, I've watched as you have turned his heart towards you and toward the world around him. So, Father, we would ask you this morning, would you, we, we rejoice in his, in his 
past and current accomplishment, but Lord, we look forward to what you're going to accomplish through him in years to come. Father, would you direct his steps? Would you use him at MCC to minister to his, his fellow students and his faculty? Would you use him to, to minister, to continue to minister to his community? And Lord, we're sure glad he's going to stick around a while and minister to his local church. Father, we pray your anointing, your blessing yes. Yes. over Jossam. Mm -hmm. Lord, would you have your way in him? Mm -hmm. Would you? Would you go before him? Show him all that you would want him to see. Equip him for all that you would want him to do. Yes. And Lord, would you, would you use him? Would you wear him out Amen. the rest of his life Amen. as he serves you, yes. as he serves his world? Yes. Lord, we sure do thank you that we're and able to be a little part of, yes. of his life through these years. Yes. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Love you, my man. And then we've got a little something from Legacy Church put in a bag because we're dying to get rid of these bags. But um, <laughs> So it's what's in the bag. And um, brother, from Legacy Church to you, um, wear it out. Sure. Show it off, wear it out. Yeah. Yeah, you can give me mine back now. Oh, yeah, that's true. And, um, <laughs> um, um, so, um, we're going to take a brief intermission. We're going to look this morning at a few verses out of the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, um, it, it was acknowledged that um, the shortest man in the Bible was Nehemiah, but then it was discovered that Bildad the shoe height um, <clears throat> won that award. He was pretty upset. Anyway, we're going to look at Nehemiah this morning. It, yeah, that shouldn't have happened. Um, but want to begin... The words from, uh, might be familiar to many of you, the words of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, that say, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Now, Father, would you, would you give us grace to trust you this morning? We sure do want straight paths in our lives. We sure do want lives that aren't all crooked and hilly and, and out of whack. Lord, we want, we want our lives to be in order with your will and your blessing. So, Lord, would you teach us this morning how to get from trusting you to straight paths? And we do thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's intentional action that that leads to true and lasting change, that leads from trusting the Lord to straight paths. A life that just is, is straight and purposeful and makes sense and doesn't meander all over, right? Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge God in everything you do, and he'll make your, your paths straight. That doesn't happen by wishful thinking. Because we all want straight paths for our lives, right? We all want our lives to make sense, to be doable, to be blessed by God. I hope you would desire that. So how do we get from trusting the Lord to straight paths? We're going to look at a man by the name of Nehemiah this morning. His ministry and his, his accomplishments of, of Nehemiah are, are amazing. If you've ever read the book of Nehemiah, um, I'll give you 15 minutes to find it because it's one of those books that just, it just moves around. It just moves around. And he accomplished some amazing things. And yet, before he took action, before he realized accomplishments that God had placed before him, there's four steps that uh, I think we see in the first four verses of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, steps that lead to lasting change. And I hope we would all hear this morning what, 
what Nehemiah does, that God would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, um, these, some principles from these first four verses of Nehemiah. Entitled this message, Fixing What is Broken. Fixing What is Broken. Uh, we've all got broken stuff in our lives, right? Stuff that's out of whack, sin has made a mess of everything. We've all got stuff that's broken in our lives. How do we? How do we even view that stuff? How do we even get started? Making corre- Is it even worth trying to make corrections in our lives? Well, a little background. We looked at Daniel, right, last week. and So just a little background. There's your history lesson, right? 722 B.C., 722 years before Christ, the Assyrians took captive the northern tribes of Israel. Then in 605, a hundred and change years later, the, the Babylonians came and began to take control of Jerusalem. And that's when they took men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We looked at last week, took some of their, their um, royal family members. And then in 586, uh, Babylon conquered the, the southern tribes of Judah. And at this point, Israel in totality is in exile. It was about the year 450-ish before Christ that Nehemiah was a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes of the Persians. The Persians then conquered the, and you know how history reads, these guys are on top of the hill, and then these guys knock them off, and then somebody else knocks them off. Well, now the the, uh, Persians are on top of the hill. Nehemiah born in exile, and and God gives him favor, and he becomes a the cupbearer, a royal cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now, cupbearer is not kind of the, the goofball that you see in, in movies and stuff, that little sidekick of the king. It was a very, very high security position. In the year 588, uh, Ezra, in the book of Ezra, uh, Ezra went and began to try to rebuild the, the city of Jerusalem, was allowed to go. Um, by the Persians, and then they faced all kind of trouble, and they were shut down. And then in about the year uh, 445, you're writing all this down, there's going to be a test. At the end of this thing, there will be a test. And you're not getting a hot dog till you pass the (laughs) Israel's history test. All right, you can have a hot dog. Um, Nehemiah is allowed to go and start to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. That's what the book of Nehemiah is all about. Nehemiah was a man of of responsibility, of vision, of prayer, of action, of perseverance. Uh, Nehemiah is used often in um, studies of leadership and and, uh, taking proactive action. By this time, we find the book of Nehemiah... Jerusalem has been in ruins for about 150 years. It's all, it's all Nehemiah had known. It was very vulnerable. There were people that were allowed to stay. Some of the common folk were allowed to stay there. And by this time, they are now living in fear. They're living in apathy. Like, we remember what Jerusalem used to be. We wish we could have been there. It's just not the same. It's in ruins now. My, don't we wish things were better. We turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, and in verse 1 we get the setting. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Shislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital. That's a summertime hangout for King Artaxerxes, and, and Nehemiah was there. Attempts had been made to rebuild Jerusalem. Those attempts had been thwarted by the surrounding uh, people groups that just didn't want Jerusalem rebuilt again. Nehemiah finds himself in a very safe place. He is hanging out in the king's palace, and he, in some sense, didn't have a care in the world. He's got all the world has to offer, right? He's in a very safe place. He's in a very comfortable place, but God is going to rattle his comfort zone. So here we go. Four things that are going to lead us from trusting God to straight paths, fixing what is broken in our lives. Number one, ask the right questions. Ask the right questions. Your your bulletin, just singular question. Nope, that should have been questions, plural. Ask the right questions. 
In verse 2, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. Ask the right questions. The wrong question is to ask ourselves, am I comfortable? Am I comfortable? Could I just live like this the rest of my days? Could I live like this just the way? Am I okay with things just the way they are? Can I get by just as I am? That's the wrong question. The right question is, what does God think about where I'm at? What does God think about where I'm at? Is God pleased with my life, with elements in my life, with this element, that element, number one, with my walk with God, my family dynamic? Is God pleased with that? Is this the way God desires things to be? That's the right question. If we're going to fix what's broken in our lives, we've got to begin by asking that right question, right? What does God think of this? Is there something God would have me to do? Two questions I want to pose to us. Number one, are people where they ought to be? Are people where they ought to be? Not geographically, but spiritually. Are people healthy? Am I healthy? Are people around me, my family, loved ones, are people where they ought to be? Ought to be truly means the way God wants them. Others walking and all the light that they have before them. Are those in my family, those around me, those in my church, are they all walking in all the light that's available? And if not, is there anything that I can do? Is there something I should do? Should I take action? Is there something I ought to do? Too often we never ask that question, right? Because we're afraid of the answer. Reminded of Jesus' words in John chapter 8, verse 29, where he says, I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. That ought to be our goal, right? To live our lives always doing the things that are pleasing to God. And it starts with me, right? It starts with you. And you're, as you're wrestling with this, it starts with you. It starts with me. The psalmist writes in Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and see if there be any anxious thoughts within me. God, search me. Is there something amiss in my heart? Is there, is there something I'm missing that I shouldn't ought to miss? Where do we want to be? Do we want to be in the middle of God's will? Do we want to be where God wants us? God created us with purpose. God created us for purpose. God created us on purpose. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Listen, here's a, here's a life verse. We make it our goal or we make it our aim to please him. Here's a verse to live by, huh? I make it my aim. I make it my goal to please God. Where, where ought I to be? What is God? Where is God's desire for me? In all the, the factors of my life, are there things that are keeping me from God's best? Is there something that I ought to address? Does that make sense? Yeah. Number one, ask the question, God, am I where I ought to be or people in my world where they ought to be? Those in my life or loved ones? Is my home in order, right? First thing we think of. Or are we just trying to fake it and hope that God blesses it, right? God, I think this isn't right, but I'm going to stand over here, and God, I'm just going to hope you come over here and bless me where I'm at. That's not the way it works, right? We say, God, where would you have me? And we walk toward God. And, and whatever, our, just our spiritual formation, uh, in our marriage, and our relationships, are people where they ought to be. And secondly, are things the way they ought to be? Are people where they ought to be? Are things the way they ought to be? Number one, are, are people where they ought to be? And two, are things the way they ought to be are inseparable, right? In some sense, you can't separate the two. The walls of Jerusalem, the gates were in shambles for 150 years. That's all that Nehemiah had ever known. He'd heard about the glory days of of Jerusalem, but now Jerusalem in shambles, the walls are torn down, the gates are burned down, and that's just normal. That's just the normal. It's the way things are. 
What about our spiritual life? Is, is God speaking to me about his walk with him? Is God speaking to you about your walk with him? Well, it's just never been all that. Um, I'll throw up a prayer every now and then. Is that the way God wants it to be, or is that just the normal, right? Is that the way God wants it, or is that just the way that it has become? Just the way it's always been. But is it the, is it the way God desires it? You've got to ask the right questions. Relationships in our life. Is God speaking to me about my marriage, about my children? Our children are grown now, we're grandkids. Um, about friendships? Is God speaking to me? Is God speaking to you about relationships in your life? And is there something you ought to do about it, right? Well, it's just the way it's always been. Yeah, but is it the way that God desires it? Important issues of life. Some say, you know, I asked before and nothing really changed, uh, so why bother? Right? I guess that's just the way things are. Uh, it is what it is. There's a biblical quote for you. It is what it is. I, you know, I've tried. I've hoped things would get better. Nehemiah was willing to ask the hard question. Um, Hannah and I, Jewish brother, comes. He could have said, hey, man, good to see you. How are things going? I don't hear what you're saying. But I'm doing great here in Susa. Things are wonderful. Have a great life, Hannah, Hannah and I. But, but Nehemiah was willing to ask the hard question. Are people where they ought to be? Are things the way they ought to be? The way God wants them? Fixing what is broken in our lives starts with asking the right question. God, how do you, how do you see elements in my life? Uh, number one, my walk with you, Lord. My, my uh, spiritual hunger in my life. Uh, uh, the way I spend my time. Ask the right question about people, about things in our lives. Secondly, we got to listen to the answer. Listen to the answer. Verse 3, And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who have survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Listen to the answer. When we ask the question, how are things? How are things in my own heart? How are things in my own life? How are things in my own home? How are things in my own church? Don't just assume. Oh, I assume they're probably just about as good as they're ever going to get. Don't ignore it. Like, I don't see that. I didn't see that. We all do that, don't we? In our own behavior and behavior in our family dynamic, I didn't see that. You ever, you ever run into somebody you know and said, hey, how are you? And they say, I'm sure glad you asked because there's this and there's this and there's this and there's this. And you're like, I just want you to say I'm fine because that's what you're supposed to say when I say, how are you? You're supposed to say, I'm good. Good. Glad to hear it. Hannah and I, when Nehemiah said, how are things? Hannah and I said, they're not good, right? The people are in distress. The walls are torn down. The gates have been burned since you asked. We've got to be willing to listen to the answer. Nehemiah listened to the answer. Number one, the answer from Scripture. The answer from Scripture, this thing we call a Bible, the owner's manual, the encyclopedia for the human experience, for our human lives that God has passed down to us, filled with wisdom. Listen to what Proverbs says, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 and following. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold... I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. In chapter 2, beginning verse 1, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight, raise your 
voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and will find the knowledge of God. God has gone to great lengths, friends, to make his wisdom available. Wisdom cries out in the streets, in the marketplace, down every alley. God's wisdom cries out. God has gone to great lengths to make his wisdom available. But we have to seek it like it's something we really want. Do we want the wisdom of God? Do we want understanding? Do we want to fear the one who made us? God has gone to great lengths. To share his wisdom, we need, to, we need to seek it. We need to search for it. God has preserved for us his word. And in cultures where, where God's word is available, um, we, uh, there shouldn't be Bibles on the shelves, right? They ought to be snarfed up because of God's wisdom. In places where the Bible's not allowed, God, by His Spirit, pours in and gives wisdom and insight. God has made His wisdom available. So what does God say? My situation and this, I don't know if, if this is right. I don't know if that's right. I don't know how I should roll with this thing. What does God say about it, about the important things of life? The words of James come to mind. James chapter 1, verse 19, be quick to hear. Slow to speak, slow to get angry. Be quick to hear. I'm ready to hear. Not, not quick to speak. Let me, let me say what I'm thinking because I think I know what God's going to say and I don't want to hear that. I'm, let's not be quick to speak and then quick to anger. Let our emotions take over. Let's be slow to speak, slow to get angry, and quick to hear, quick to listen. Revelations chapter, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, to every one of those churches, Jesus says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do we have a hear, an ear to hear? When we identify, when we ask the hard questions, how is my life? How is this element in my life? Is, is it pleasing to God? We've got to stop and listen for the answer, right? What, is, what does God say? What does the Scripture say? I believe this with all of my heart, friends, that God wants to speak to you about your life. I thought God just wanted to talk about bad people outside the church. No, God wants to speak to you about your life. Do we have ears to hear? Do we want to hear what God has to say to us? God has answers. God has principles in his word. Does God give us specific answers to every specific prayer we ask? I can't find a Bible verse about whether or not I should take this job or that job. can't find a Bible verse about whether or not I should buy this house or buy that house. You can find a Bible verse about whether I should attend this church or that church. But there are principles, there are specific principles in God's Word that can lead us and guide us as we spend time with God. Say, God, as I apply these principles to my life, would you help me make this decision that would, that would best please you, right? And God is faithful to do that. God always has specific principles that we can apply to every area of life upon which we can make clear decisions. Answers from Scripture. Secondly, let's listen to the answers from circumstances. Answers from circumstances. Nehemiah was fam familiar with the, the Hebrew Scriptures, God's Word. He's probably familiar with the prophecies of Jeremiah who wept. Jeremiah wrote, we call him the weeping prophet because he looked at the city of Jerusalem. Uh, he also wrote Lamentations, the lament. Some have called it the funeral of a city. Jerusalem, as Jeremiah looks and he, he sees the judgment of God coming upon Jerusalem because of her sin. Nehemiah was familiar with God's word. But now the circumstances are speaking to Jeremiah. The circumstances are saying, uh, look at us. Look at where we're at. Look at what's become of us. Circumstances speak. 
Sometimes circumstances say, I'm broke really bad. I am broken, right? Sometimes our circumstances say, things shouldn't be like this. This isn't right. Things should not be like this. Sometimes circumstances say, hey, I'm a gift from God and you ought to give thanks for me, right? Circumstances speak to us. Sometimes, hey, this isn't the way it ought to be. Sometimes it's, you ought to rejoice over this because you didn't do that, right? God did that for you. We need to discern the difference as circumstances speak to us. When things are broken in our lives, there's a lack of order, there is dysfunction. We either listen to the circumstances or we ignore them, concede, yeah, that's probably not the way it ought to be. Yeah, my marriage probably isn't the way it ought to be, but eh, that's just the way it is. It's probably a, all, the way it's always going to be because our relationships speak, right? Circumstances speak. Our relationships speak. Sometimes they say, I need attention. Sometimes they say, I need compassion. Sometimes they say, I need boundaries, right? With your kids, I need boundaries. Are we listening? Are we listening? If we're going to fix what is broken, it requires that we listen, that we ask the right questions and then listen to the answer. The answer from Scripture, number one, and the answer from circumstances. Number three, he asked the right questions. He listened uh, to the answer. Number three, sit down and pray. How about that for profound? Sit down and pray. Verse 4, really all the rest of chapter 1, but verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Sit down and pray. Nehemiah, for at least a month or more, prayed over this thing before he took action. He asked the right question. How are things really? He listened for the answer. Ah, they're not the way God wants them. And he sat down and prayed for a month or more. If we have the courage to ask the right questions, if we have the courage to listen to the answer, then we're going to need courage to embrace the answer, right? Which is our first point. Embrace the issues. Embrace the issues. Sit down and embrace the issues. Not merely accept the issues. Yeah, it's, uh, this is like this and this is like this. Yeah, it's probably not the way God wants it, but that's eh, the way it is, and I can survive like that. Today we say, hey, we need to sit down and talk. Right? We, or we need to sit down and look at our finances. We need to, what does that mean? That means we need to drop what we're doing and embrace this issue, right? We need to sit down and talk, discuss, look at this, figure this out, right? Either we ignore the issue or we face the issue. We need to sit down. Nehemiah sat down, took all this in. He was living a comfortable life. He could have said, pray for you, buddy. Best of luck to you. But he allowed, he allowed the situation in Jerusalem to grip his heart and to say, there might be something I could do about this. He sat down. He wept and he mourned for days. Allowed God to stir his passions. He fasted. No doubt during which time he's saying, God, is there something you want me to do? Is there something I should do? If not, fine, but let's start with that. Is there something, is there anything that I can do, anything that I should do? I look at this and I have to ask myself, do I, do I mourn over the brokenness in my life? Do you mourn over the brokenness in your life? Does it cause you to sit down and weep and mourn and fast and pray? Or do we just say, yeah, oh well, it's the way it is. You know what, sometimes there's nothing we can do, right? But there just might be something we can do and we ought to sit down and pray until we figure that out, right? Do we understand? Is there something I can do or, or not? We either run from our issues, we ignore our issues, or we embrace our issues. Again, Nehemiah, very comfortable, very comfortable, yet he hurt. He hurt for the things 
in Jerusalem the way God intended them. And he was going to be asked to step out of it. He was already asked to step out of his comfort zone, right? He could have said, you know what, I got a good thing going here. I'm just going to do this. But God stirred his heart. He had a choice. Oh, well, too bad. Uh, I wish things were better. Here's a meal ticket, then go home. But he said, is there something I can do? Is there something I should do? When we face the issues in our lives, we need to ask the question, right, and, ready, and be ready for the answer. We need to listen to the answer, and then we need to sit down and say, God, is there something I, I ought to be doing different? Is there something I can do in my marriage, in my parenting, in, in my ministry life, or whatever it might, might be? Embrace the issues. Secondly, pray for direction. I'm guessing Nehemiah was doing that. And the rest of chapter 1 uh, deals with that, with uh, Nehemiah's prayer. Took a month. God, what would you have me do? Lord, you really put this thing on my heart. It's, it's heavy on my heart. Things aren't right in Jerusalem. What would you have me to do? How often? How often do we ask that? God, I, I see this. You've allowed me to see something's not right in my life, around my life. Something's not right. How often do we, in our prayer time, say, God, what would you have me do? Often in our prayer time, it's, Lord, are you seeing this? This thing isn't right. Are you seeing what's going on over here? Did you see what so-and-so did? How often do we sit down in prayer and say, God, what would you have me to do? Well, how would you direct me? What would you have me to do? Matthew 7, verse 7 and following, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. That's in the present tense. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. God, what would you have me to do? Nehemiah was determined to do something. And so he prayed after he was informed of what was going on. He prayed. He didn't just say, Lord, would you please change this thing? He said, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do with the city, the city of my people, my heritage? It's been torn down now for 150 years. That's all we know. We want your glory on the earth again. When we are willing to embrace the issues and we're willing to do our part, we're going to need wisdom and we're going to need courage, right? Right? Now, you've probably been there. I see this is broken. I want to do something, but I need wisdom, right? I need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I need wisdom, and I need courage. How often do we say, I prayed, I prayed twice about it, and God didn't do anything. The question is, what is he telling you to do? What is he telling me to do about the things that are broken in our lives? Sit down and pray. If we're going to fix what is broken in our lives, we need to sit down, embrace the issue, and we need to pray. Uh, not just complain, but pray. God, take action. We do a lot. I do a lot of complaining. God, the world's a mess. Our nation's a mess. Do you see what's going on here, God? How about we pray? God, what would you have me to do about my nation? What would you have me to do about my community? Where can I start? Instead of, God, this is just a mess. And I'm all about praying for Jesus to return. But until he does, I think he's all about us doing something, yeah. right? And, and being busy and asking him, Lord, things are a mess. Yeah, so I want you to do this. Take care of your little part of the mess, right? All of us have a little part of the mess, if you will. And fourth, take action. Ask the right questions. Is my life the way God wants it? Is my life oriented toward the things of God? Is, is, is my marriage, my family, my friends, my church the way it ought to be? And then listen for the answer. And then pray. And fourth, we need to take action. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, the whole of it, well, actually the next five, six chapters. But uh, you turn ahead to Nehemiah 6.15. It says they, they completed the wall in 52 days. 
How did, how did Nehemiah do that? Big time principle right here. Number one, take the first step. Take the first step. Nehemiah uh, is in the presence of King Artaxerxes, most powerful man on the earth. And Artaxerxes say, says, Nehemiah, uh, you look sad, but I don't think you're sick. What's up? Uh, we believe Ezra probably wrote Nehemiah, and he writes that Nehemiah prayed. Like a great time to pray. When the king says, why are you sad? Great time to pray. Uh, Lord, let me get this right because this could be my last prayer. He was in Artaxerxes' presence. Artaxerxes said, why are you sad? Uh, he, he prayed and said, king, O king, live forever. Uh, but my city, Jerusalem, the city of my people, the walls are torn down and the gates are burned with fire. Gulp. And the hand of God was all over Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes looks at Nehemiah and says, so what would you like to do? Nehemiah says, I'd like to go and take a group of men with me. Gulp. Artaxerxes says, sure, how long are you going to be gone? Shouldn't take long. Then Nehemiah, gulp again, prayer. And by the way, O king, live forever, great guy. Uh, would you write some letters that we could take and give to some of the, uh, the lords of the, uh, the peoples around Jerusalem so they don't just think we're running away from you, that, that you have sanctioned this thing that we're doing? Would you do that? Yes, I would. And God's hand was all over that. When we sense, when we sense that we know what God wants us to do, we need direction and we need courage from God. We need direction from God. We need courage from God. Nehemiah prayed and he got courage from God and God did the rest. Joshua chapter 1, three times. Chapter 1, verse 6, again in verse 7, again in verse 9. God tells uh, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Third time, be strong and very courageous. When we know God's will, we know that God has called us to a thing to call us, call us, has called us to help to start fixing something in our lives, we first need courage, right? The whole process, pretty intimidating, uh, pretty overwhelming to Nehemiah. I'm going to go, I'm going to take a handful of guys, and we're going to go rebuild the city wall of Jerusalem. That was probably a bit overwhelming. But here's what he did. He just took the first step. He just did the next thing. Instead of looking at the whole enchilada, it's getting close to lunch. Don't use words like enchilada. (laughs) Instead of looking at the whole picture and I'm going to go do this, how about we just say, God, what's the, what's the first step? What's the next thing? Just do the next thing. I don't know how many times I've uh, been talking with folks about doing this or that. Just what's the next thing you need to do? Just do the next thing. My marriage is broken. It's overwhelming. I don't think it'll ever get better. Just do the next thing. Take the first step. What is it? What's the first thing you need to do? What's the next thing you need to do? Addiction got this or that I'm just wrestling with, can't break free from it. I'm overwhelmed by the thought of, of walking into freedom. Just do the next thing, right? Do the next thing. The habit in your life, ministry that you're pursuing, vocation that you're pursuing, ah, it's all overwhelming. Take the next step, right? Take the first step, the next step, the next step. And I know it's lunch, but eat that elephant one bite at a time right? A little teaser on what's for lunch. All right, and then last, take action. Uh, Take the first step, and last, trust God. Back to where we started, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and then he will make your path straight. How do we get from trusting God to straight paths? By not leaning on our own understanding and acknowledging God in all of our ways, right? God's ways lead to God's best. 
Can't put it any more simply than that. God's ways leads to God's best. Let's, t- let's take the first step in, towards God's ways and whatever it is that's amiss in our lives, whatever's broken in our lives. The psalmist, Psalm 32, verse 10, writes this, Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Those who don't trust in the Lord, whose, whose lives are crooked and twisty and hilly, many are the sorrows of the wicked. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Tell me that doesn't sound like a straight path. Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. That's the blessed life right there, isn't it? Steadfast love. That sense, uh, I'll never be sick again, I'll never have a hard day again. No, but you will have the presence of Jesus, right? The steadfast love will surround those who trust in the Lord. Fixing what is broken. We need to ask the right questions. Hey, I'm afraid of the answer, but I'm going to ask, how is this area in my life? How's my walk with God? How's my relationships? Then listen for the answer. What does God have to say? This thing just doesn't seem right. What do the circumstances say? Sit down, embrace the issue, and pray. And then trust God, right? Trust God because he is faithful. I want to leave us with this conclusion. Lasting change requires intentional action. God's word offers clear principles. Lasting change requires intentional actions. We've got to take some steps. We've got to do some things between trust in the Lord and straight paths. But God's word offers clear principles. That is both very profound and very simple pattern, isn't it? And this whole thing starts with trusting God. That's where the whole thing starts. You want to walk in a life that's made, that you were designed to live, the way you were created to live, it begins by trusting the one who created you. Not going anywhere without that, right? To know the one who created me for purpose, on purpose. We've all broken God's law. We all stand guilty before a, a holy creator. But what did God do for guilty sinners like you and me? He stepped out of glory, and the man of Jesus Christ, 100% man, 100% God, walked perfect before us, gave his life for us, that we would trust in him and what he accomplished, because what we have accomplished is just breaking God's law over and over and over. We don't trust in going to church enough. We don't trust in trying to be good enough. We trust in the one who is perfect, the one who created us, before whom we will stand one day. We have all broken God's law. We are all broken. And healing, straight paths, a life that that pleases God begins with trusting the one who created us. His name is Jesus. Please, please do not let the sun go down this day without putting your trust in him. Putting your trust in him. Lord, I, I can't do this thing. It's all pretty overwhelming. You want to take the next step? The next step is trusting Jesus. Lord, I have sinned against you. I'm sorry for my sin. Would you forgive me of my sin? I want to be cleansed. We repent and believe. That is the gospel. Repent, turn from our sin, and believe the gospel. Would you pray with me? Father, we admit this morning that there's no lack, no shortage of brokenness in our lives. You created us gloriously in your image. But we chased after our own heart's desire. We broke your law over and over, and it left us broken. Lord, would you give us grace to ask the right question this morning? Who is Jesus in my life? How am I before a holy God? To listen to the answer. Lord, we thank you for your answer book. We thank you for your scriptures. Give us principles. Give us truth. Unwavering truth that we need Jesus. Lord, may we not just brush this aside, another church service chalked up, but may we sit down. May we sit down and embrace. Where is, where is my life? 
where are the elements of my life at? And Lord, may we take the first step. May we take the next step. God, I would ask even right now that you would show each one of us those areas that have surfaced to the top this morning, those areas in our lives that aren't the way they ought to be, would you show us the next step, the next thing to do? And Lord, we trust you. We trust you in all of it. Father, we thank you that you make whole the brokenhearted. You make straight the crooked lives. You make tender the hard heart. Would you do that, Lord, as we close this morning? Would you do that in our lives as we, as we look to you in these closing moments? And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you just stand with us one more time, we're going to sing In Christ Alone. drought and storm what heights of love what depth of peace when fears are sealed when the striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, Sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand here in the power of christ i'll stand in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, 
from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever plug me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand On Christ On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Oh, on Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand till he returns till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ, we stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, I hope that you have both of your feet planted on the solid rock today to the day he calls you out of here. That is my prayer. Thank you for being here. Have a blessed week. And you are dismissed. <laughs>